So good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. So the first item on our agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have one additional item to add to today's agenda. And so this will be uh, one care will present on a risk mitigation strategy per the 2018 budget order with a potential board vote. We would put this as item number five on today's agenda. Hearing no objections, I'll place it as item five on the agenda. And then uh, as a reminder, we have a very busy month ahead. Uh, we will be hearing, we will have two hearings on the exchange rate review. And those are on Monday, July 23rd at 9 a.m. over at the State House. That's in room 10. That's Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then on Tuesday, July 24th, we have our second rate review hearing for MVP Healthcare at 9 a.m. And that's located in room 11 at the State House. We'll also have an additional public comment period on Tuesday, July 24th. And that's located at Memorial Room at the Montpelier City Hall. And that starts at 4.30 to 6.30, again, on Ju July 24th. And all of this information is on our website. We might also want to mention the Workforce Summit at Castleton University on August 2nd. Okay. And then I will mention on August 1st the GMCB Advisory Committee meeting. So busy time ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 27th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Marine has moved to approve the uh, minutes of Wednesday, June 27th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Tom has seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? One abstention. Yeah, somebody was busy on an island. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, at this point we'll invite uh, Melissa and Mike and Pat and Michelle to come down. Are you breaking it up into two and two again or are you doing all four? Three. Three. <laughs> no. Four. <laughs> so whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you very much, Chair Mullen. Um, today is, uh, uh oh. Okay, there we go. So today we are back uh, to review the 2019 ACO guidance and um, the 2019 Medicare ACO initiative. We first presented the ACO budget and reporting requirements to you on June 13th and had that open for two weeks of public comment. So we will review that and discuss a potential vote. Then um, we will also be following up on the 2019 quality measure set that's required for the 2019 Medicare ACO initiative and some operational changes that are being considered for that ACO initiative. And then finally, uh, we will review a timeline for new certification criteria that was legislated in 2018 by the Vermont Legislature. So we received two written comments uh, on the 2019 ACO budget guidance. Um, the first was from the Vermont Legal Aid, and the, the healthcare advocate provided comments on two areas. Uh, one was patient affordability and cost sharing for patients, and one was measurement of patient experience. So in summary, um, the concern with the patient affordability and cost sharing for patients is that while the ACO model is changing the financial incentives for providers, patients remain in the fee-for-service world, regardless of the payment arrangements between insurance and providers. And so the healthcare advocate is concerned that if patients are struggling to afford their insurance premiums or cost sharing payments, they may avoid care prescribed under the new ACO health reform model, which could threaten the ACO's ability to be successful. 
And then secondly, the measurement of patient experience and shared decision making. Uh, the healthcare advocate is interested in the board and the ACO's measuring of patient experience in the model, including shared decision making and the ability for patients to follow their uh, shared care plans. And the healthcare advocate has asked the board and the ACO to move forward with a patient centered point of care measure to assess patients' experience of shared decision making. So, would you like me to continue on to? discuss the other comment, the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals? Yes. Okay. So during the quality measures public comment period, we received a comment from the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals. And it was regarding um, part of the ACO budget guidance that looks at the ACO population health and quality metrics. And they wanted to propose an additional metric for measuring the uh, population health program investments of the ACO. And specifically items that they suggested were strategies for ensuring safe staffing of healthcare facilities, including but not limited to enforceable nurse patient ratios, wages that will recruit and retain nurses, and tuition reimbursement and student loan repayment programs. So those were the comments that we received in the time period that the guidance was open. So we've made one change since the guidance was in front of you, and that was that we added a question that we had in last year on administrative burden. And the question reads, describe strategies for expanding capacity in existing primary care practices, including but not limited to reducing administrative burden on such practices. Um, this language matches up to the Act 113 criteria from the legislature in 2016. And finally, we also add, uh, expanded on the primary care specification. We've been talking about the codes with OneCare and also with our analytics team. And in running some analysis, there were some additional codes recommended for this test specification for 2018. Other than that, we have made no changes. Um, so now we can have a discussion and a potential vote on the guidance to move forward for 2019. Okay, are there questions from the board? At this point, uh, do you want to open it up to questions from the public before or after you make your recommendation? Um, my thought was to have a motion and then Okay. Rob, do you have a motion? I sure do. Uh, I move that we approve the 2019 ACO budget guidance with uh, the addition of the question that Melissa just went through on uh, slide four of the presentation and the final primary care specification. So. It's been moved. <laughs> Is there any further discussion from the board? If not, we'll open it up to the uh, public for any discussion. Seeing none, um, I'll give the board one last opportunity to have any discussion before I call the vote. I, I don't have any discussion, but I would just say that I appreciated both of the public comments that we received, uh, and I think that uh, just from my personal perspective, um, I do think the affordability issue is something that we will be thinking about as we move forward with looking at utilization measures. And to me, it makes sense to do those things in combination, so it's premature to act on it right this second. Um, and um, from a previous meeting, we had heard that the healthcare advocate and the ACO were discussing the patient experience measure, so I'm hopeful that they will continue to do that um, moving forward. Um, and then on the, the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals comment, um, to me, the, the staffing issue is something that might be more appropriate to think about in the context of a hospital budget than really in the ACO program. So that's why I was not 
thinking we needed to uh, act on that in terms of changing anything in the guidance? And we have historically asked those questions. Here. Absolutely. We get information on staffing already. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Robin. Sure. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the 2019 Medicare ACO Initiative Quality Measure Set. Thank you, Melissa. Aside from the written public comment that Robin just addressed and that Melissa spoke to earlier, um, we received no additional public comment other than those that you heard in person here at the board meeting on the 27th from both the HCA and OneCare. Um, so the, um, as a reminder, these are the 13 measures that we're putting before the board today um, for reference and the staff is recommending that these measures are approved and sent to uh, CMMI for incorporation into the 2019 participation agreement between OneCare and CMS. Be short and sweet. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, are there any questions from the board? If not, uh, would someone like to make a motion? I'll be happy to make a motion. I move that we approve the set of quality measures as outlined in the uh, proposed measures that are included in our packet and presented and that were presented on June 27th at our meeting uh, for use in the 2019 Vermont Modified Next Generation ACO program between CMMI or Centers for Medicare and Medicare Medicaid Services and One Care Vermont and to also direct our staff to provide a measure set uh, to both of those parties for their incorporation into the participation agreement. Is there a second? Seconded by uh, Jess. Um, any discussion? Now I'll open it up to the public for discussion on the quality measures. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna call the question on the quality measures, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Just leave that there. Um, so in addition to the quality measures, um, one care has uh, requested some, I guess, operational changes as part of the 2019 Medicare ACO initiative, and um, uh, we we asked One Care to put those ideas in writing so that uh, you should have a memo in your packets um, that sets out the four um, things that they would like to see. Uh, and so I'm going to go through those. Um, I guess our plan is to essentially pass that memo that we received from OneCare on to CMMI with a, a cover letter essentially that um, sets forth the board's thoughts on the requests. Um, so the first request you'll see has to do with ACO governance requirements in the Medicare participation agreement. Uh, currently, Medicare requires that at least 75% control of an ACO's governing body be held by next generation participants or their designated representatives. Um, CMS can grant an exception to, the, to that requirement, uh, but rather than request an exception, what OneCare wants to do is change the agreement to require that its governing body be comprised of at least 75% next generation participants and preferred providers in its network. Um, so the distinction between next generation participants and preferred providers is that next generation participants attribute lives to the ACO and are responsible for reporting quality through the ACO, whereas preferred providers do not attribute lives. Um, and a concrete example of preferred providers within OneCare's network are skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, 
um, mental health designated agencies, uh, I think would all be considered preferred providers. So we, our recommendation is uh, that we indicate our support for this request um, because first of all, it, it is consistent with rule five. So rule five, also speaks to ACO governance. It requires that an ACO have a governing body that's comprised of at least 75% ACO participants or their designated representatives, but it defines ACO participants broadly in a way that would include Medicare preferred providers. So it's consistent with Rule 5, and it also, it seems, supports a more inclusive governance structure at the ACO uh, that allows skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies to participate in ACO governance without having to be essentially a designated representative of a next generation participant. That's it's a little complicated, but let me stop there. Is that, do you have any questions on that? Um, before I open it up to questions on that, uh, Judy, uh, would it be appropriate for us to have one motion at the end of the uh, series of staff recommendations, or do we need to vote on these separately? So I think the plan is to, uh, sorry, um, open it up to public comment period and then come back in two weeks for a, for a potential vote. Okay. And I was going to get there. I'm sorry. I should have left that. Would you prefer that uh, public questions be taken on a case-by-case -case basis or wait till after you've presented all four? Um, I think probably wait till after I've presented all four. Okay. Sorry. Any questions from the board on the first recommendation? I have a quick one. Um, this doesn't otherwise change the beneficiary representation on the, on one cares board. Is that right? That's correct. Thanks. So Medicare requires has certain requirements, and the rule has certain requirements, and those would not be affected. Thank you. So the second request has to do with uh, beneficiary notification, and currently Medicare participation agreement requires OneCare to notify aligned Medicare beneficiaries that their provider is participating in a Medicare ACO, uh, and, th and the ACO OneCare has to use a, basically a template letter that CMS provides them. And what OneCare is asking to do is they would like to use uh, their own letter, which they attach to uh, their request. And our recommendation is that uh, we also support this request. Um, basically, OneCare has uh, explained to us that this year's letter that they got from CMS was written in a way that was confusing to a number of Medicare beneficiaries. They got a number of calls and complaints stating that it was confusing, um, and the, the letter that they attached, they hope, will uh, reduce confusion. It is aligned with uh, the Medicaid letter that Medicaid beneficiaries get, uh, which had input from the healthcare advocate, we're told. Um, so uh, we think this is consistent with the goal of alignment as well as reducing confusion um, amongst uh, Medicare beneficiaries. So we would want to transmit this to CMMI with a note of support. Okay, does the board have any questions on that? Yeah. I just had, so is that supposed to say that CMS would need to approve the letter? Yes, they would still need to approve the letter. Okay. The third request has to do with an audit that CMS conducts each year to ensure that a Medicare ACO is complying with the requirements of its participation agreement. So uh, OneCare has pointed out that there's overlap between the requirements of that Medicare participation agreement and the re certification requirements of Rule 5, uh, and there is overlap. An example would be um, you know, the Medicare agreement requires that an ACO have a conflict of interest policy that applies to its uh, governing body. There's a similar requirement in the certification provisions of Rule 5 because, you know, we thought it made sense to have uh, that requirement apply to any ACO that's operating in Vermont, regardless of whether they're particip participating with Medicare. Um, 
but there is not complete alignment. So, for example, the governance issue that I just talked about, there's not complete alignment. Um, what one care basically wants is to have CMS deem uh, the requirements of the audit met where the Green Mountain Care Board has looked at a similar issue in its certification process. Um, you know, they're trying to reduce their their burden. Uh, essentially, you know, they went through a pretty extensive readiness review with DIVA for the Medicaid program. They went through a pretty intensive certification process with us, and now they're undergoing a Medicare process as well. So they're trying to cut down on, on that burden. Um, to us, this seemed less like a like a program design issue where the board would have maybe more of a role to play and more of a CMS compliance issue. Um, so our recommendation uh, would be to, you know, obviously send this along to CMMI with a note that basically says that, uh, as well as point out the fact that, like I mentioned, there there is overlap, but there is not complete alignment. And then the final request uh, had to do with uh, approval of descriptive materials. So currently CMS requires that any materials that mention the Medicare uh, program um, be approved by a CMS contractor. And OneCare wants to be able to submit these kinds of materials directly to the team at CMMI that will be overseeing the Vermont-specific program, which makes a lot of sense to us. So, um, but it also, again, seems to relate less to a program design issue and more to a CMS kind of operational issue. So, uh, again, our proposal here, a recommendation is to, to send this to CMS, um, you know, uh, stating as much and um, indicating support for the general idea of having an expedited type review for one care. And just to clarify to Maureen's previous point, CMS has to agree to all four of these, regardless of what we recommend, uh, Absolutely. they still have yeah. the final say. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, our, our plan would be to transmit this to CMI and then CMMI and then uh, CMS would have to, CMMI would have to agree to it and then we would work through uh, essentially the language about you know the language to include in the participation agreement. Uh, so we are recommending that we open this up for a public comment period. Um, I think. 10 days we discussed, come back to you on August 1st for a potential vote, and the vote would be on that, that plan that I just discussed. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, there will be working with CMMI to implement this, uh, review the language, make sure it, it does what we think it does. Um, and I think it makes sense to delegate that implementation to the chief of health policy rather than like coming back and presenting the language to you and having you vote on it. Um, so that would be our recommendation. Do you have any questions? Questions for me? I have more of a comment. Um, just on the delegation thing, I think that makes sense because uh, we don't vote on the contracts between any other payer and uh, the ACO prior to implementation. And while we have a greater role in program design with CMS, I think it, that is, to me, a staff function. So I, I like that idea. Any other discussion? If not at this time, we'll open it up to the public for comments and discussion. Very quiet day. <laughs> so. You want to just run us through the timetable, Mike? Yeah. 
Okay, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the 2018 Vermont legislative session produced three new requirements that an accountable co-organization <laughs> must satisfy in order to obtain and maintain certification from the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, up here are the three acts. One was related to systemic improvements of the mental health system. One was related to ensuring a coordinated public health approach to addressing childhood adversity. And then finally, um, the final one was the act that related to healthcare regulatory duties of the Green Mountain Care Board. I have each of the, the specific language here if you're interested. We did review it when we were um, here back in the end of June. So what I am here today to present is the idea of a certification timeline and um, potential criteria that the staff is coming up with that we would put forth to you in a memo and then open the time period up for public comment. So as you'll see up here, we have a timeline by which we would uh, provide a memo, which would be next Wednesday, um, and then we would open it up for public comment until the end of July, review the public comment with you on August 1st, and then depending on what the public comment is, either incorporated into the proposed criteria or perhaps um, you, know, you would take the opportunity to vote on the August 1st if the public comment is in line with what we are doing. And then finally, we would vote, hopefully on the verification form on um, Wednesday, August 8th, and distribute the form to OneCare by August 10th for their response on October 1st. Um, we would incorporate the criteria that we are um, developing in the verification form that you have already seen that we developed to go along with the certification for one here to maintain their certification. So we're complete with our presentation today. I'd like to open it up for discussion. Is there any discussion from the board? So now I'll give the audience one more opportunity for public comment or discussion. And seeing none, thank you very much, team. Thank you. Excellent work. So at this point, we'll ask uh, Dr. Brumstead and his team to come forward. Do you need another chair, or are you just going to sit back there? There's the hang on. Back there is a bit Okay. So just by way of uh, starting off, um, as part of the uh, budget uh, reconciliations for the previous year, we had a discussion about um, allocating dollars towards trying to alleviate the pressure that hospitals are seeing, um, especially for um, uh, acute in-care uh, psychiatric beds. And uh, we had set up a timeline uh, with the first report being July 1. And uh, we actually have two, the first report that was sent in by UVM and a supplemental report. And that can be found on our website. Um, do you have a link, Susan, or? Yeah, it's, it's actually listed right under the materials for today. And okay. then we are actually going to make a new section on our website for these implementation, or court, the quarterly reports from UVM. So this will actually be the first of the quarterly reports on the progress being made in, in the areas of mental health. And so we're excited to uh, hear the presentation. Um, I just want to say, Dr. Bromstead, that there probably is the elephant in the room with um, everybody being focused on the uh, strike. And obviously, uh, um, we do not have a role to play in that. And um, you've been very good about keeping us updated about the contingency plans and everything else so that patients will be safe. But I did want to give you an opportunity, if you wanted to say anything before you started on mental health. Um, just because I'm sure that everybody has that running through their brain. Well, thank you for uh, that opportunity, Chairman Mullen. Um, uh, it is um, uh, a tense time, uh, but I can assure you that um, from the management side, we are at the table, will remain at the table, 
and uh, do everything we can to avert the strike um, because that's not good for anybody, least of all uh, our patients. And um, what we have done is the contingency planning is um, uh, tight. It's very well done. Uh, the academic medical center and level one trauma center, um, if we are unable to avert a strike, uh, will be uh, open for business and very uh, well staffed on Thursday and Friday. But again, thank you, and we're doing everything we possibly can to not get to that uh, to that point. But thanks for that opportunity. We wish you well. Thank you. And thanks for giving us time on your agenda today. Um, uh, even with that um, uh, transpiring in Burlington, this is so important to uh, our patients and to the state of Vermont. Uh, we just um, could not see not coming. And so thank you for providing us time on uh, the agenda to give this initial early report on our progress to plan and build additional inpatient capacity for most, uh, uh, the most acute adult psychiatric uh, patients. And I'm joined here today by Anna Noonan, who actually is coming up on her one year anniversary uh, as President and Chief Operating Officer at Center Vermont Medical Center, happy anniversary. Um, and Eric Miller, uh, who's our Deputy General Counsel um, uh, for the University of Vermont Health Network. Um, and uh, these two dedicated folks uh, are co-chairing uh, part of the process, and I'll come to that in a minute. You know, as we've discussed previously many times and in many uh, forums over the past uh, couple of years, Vermont's mental health system, actually as it is in many states, is in a state of crisis. And the crisis, we can't kid ourselves, is multidimensional and multifaceted. Um, there is, however, one very visible uh, component epitomized by patients uh, in acute need of an inpatient psychiatric bed languishing in emergency rooms, uh, and this languishing in emergency rooms in every hospital uh, in the state of Vermont. And the effects of this uh, are many. Um, delayed treatment for mental health issues uh, is the most important. Obviously, that's a different site of service than we would like to be providing uh, care for in these uh, patients. But that's uh, followed closely by the stress on emergency room staff and providers, as well as the increased cost of care. And we've talked about that directly uh, for the medical center uh, in Burlington, but also for Center Vermont. This also impacts and potentially delays care for those needing uh, uh, the emergency room for medical or surgical issues. And several times in uh, the past uh, four months, um, at the University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington, uh, the state's only level one trauma center, um, half of the capacity of that emergency room has been taken up by uh, folks needing uh, a different site of service, needing uh, acute uh, inpatient psychiatric uh, bed. So the crisis still exists, and we actually have some data, early data, that the situation might be worsening, particularly uh, at Centre Vermont. Um, and we believe strongly that additional capacity for acute inpatients uh, will alleviate this specific aspect of the problem. And once the emergency rooms are decompressed, we can proceed to address some of the uh, other issues um, and uh, stay engaged. I think we need to very much uh, avoid the uh, belief that just adding inpatient capacity for adult acute, sometimes termed level one patients, are going to be a fix-all. I mean, we really have to look at this much more holistically, but I've used the metaphor that we have sort of a log jam in this state that's precipitating the crisis, and our belief is that uh, adding inpatient 
capacity is pulling a key log out and should allow uh, the, uh, the river to flow, but still there's going to be other uh, aspects of this that down the road we're going to have to all collectively work on. So as you mentioned, uh, uh, Chairman Mullen, on July 2nd, we filed our initial uh, UVM Health Network quarterly report on inpatient mental health capacity. This was followed yesterday with answers to questions that came from the Green Mountain Care Board uh, staff. Um, um, and we trust that at this early stage in our planning process, we are fulfilling your requirements, uh, your regulatory requirements, but we look forward to further discussions on how to best align your reporting needs in our planning process as we move uh, down the road. This is, in my experience, the first time we've sort of tried to do this uh, uh, together. And so um, uh, I know our staffs have already had some communication, and uh, we really want to keep working on this because this may be a precedent for uh, other things that we collectively engage in. I'm going to describe the resources that we're dedicating to this planning effort, uh, as well as where we are with our uh, data analysis methodology. And Anna's going to provide information on the structure of the process uh, that we're launching and give some thoughts on uh, the Central Vermont location and um, her interactions with uh, her Central Vermont hospital community and the broader Barry Montpelier community uh, about uh, this. And there should be lots of time for questions, but feel free to ask uh, along the way, uh, you know, interrupt me if, if that works for you. Uh, you can note in our report that the steering committee includes many of the most senior network leaders. And I would say, you know, when I do resource allocation, um, sometimes it's about money, sometimes it's about facilities, but the most impactful and the most important is how we use our human resources, uh, um, particularly our leaders. And we have not done this uh, on the cheap, as you can see, uh, from who we have on the steering committee. Notably, we've got Dr. Uh, uh, Bob Perrottini, who's chair of psychiatry. Uh, I'm there. Uh, we have leaders uh, in clinical integration, communications, government relations, facilities, and finance. And we focused our efforts uh, uh, of the UVM Health Network Planning Department on this. It's not their sole uh, focus, but you know, we have significant planning resources that uh, are dedicated. And we've engaged HALSA advisors, and this firm specializes in bringing together uh, an organization or a group's strategy and operations to make something practical. Um, uh, and they've focused mainly on uh, healthcare facilities. And we've used this firm uh, and are very pleased with the work that they've done for us for most of the UVM Medical Center projects and now many around the network, including the planning and the programming and the sizing of the Miller Building, uh, which obviously is a very large project. And importantly, on the steering committee, we have Lewis Josephson from the Brattleboro Retreat. He's willingly agreed to uh, participate. And of course, you know, with the key role that the Brattleboro Retreat plays in all of this, we feel that Lou being at the table uh, really uh, uh, is, is helpful. And I've asked Anna uh, and Eric uh, Miller to co-chair the steering committee and a planning committee and how the steering and planning committee come together. Um, uh, I believe Anna will uh, describe how all of that fits together. And uh, as an aside, we really couldn't have two better people to lead this very complex iterative uh, iterative process than, uh, uh, than Anna and Eric. Um, our current approach to data and data, uh, data analysis uh, methodology um, uh, is what we're using, obviously, to determine the capacity needed. Um, and I'll note that we are working with others, including uh, the Department of Mental Health and uh, the uh, VAS, to refine the method used. We want to do this up front 
because you know we want to come up with a methodology that everybody believes is valid because that's going to lead us to a result that um, uh, although there will be clearly people who think it's too small or too big um, if we get the right mix of that and have everybody on board we'll all compromise so we want to make sure that we vet the methodology that we're using um, we actually have in-depth information on our network inpatient psychiatric units uh, and those from around the state, which, as you saw in the report or in the answers to the uh, interrogatories, um, they essentially run at full capacity. Um, they're uh, mid-90s uh, percent, um, and June was the latest month that we picked out, but that is what we've been seeing for some time. And when we look at the uh, most acute, those uh, termed uh, level one, essentially we're uh, at the red line. We're 100% occupied uh, all the time. We also have extensive data on psychiatric patients in our emergency department at Porter Medical Center and our emergency department and inpatients uh, at uh, the uh, Center for Mont Medical Center and uh, the UVM Medical Center. And at this early stage, um, what we're doing is we're using those data sets and using uh, Porter as um, a good surrogate for critical access hospitals around the state so we can extrapolate from that to what the situation in the critical access hospital emergency rooms are. Um, uh, and sent Vermont data, we would do the same uh, and extrapolate for the other PPS hospitals around the state. And then using the VAS database and the Department of Mental Health data sets, we can confirm or modify that. And there has been um, discussion actually as recently as yesterday with uh, Vaz and the Department of Mental Health around an analytic tool uh, that um, they're considering using. And so how that fits into the mix is something that is in active uh, discussions right now. And like I said before, it's my belief that this methodology that we uh, all agreed to up front will produce an accurate count of the beds needed uh, for the uh, to serve this currently underserved population. And it is my full expectation coming in that, uh, uh, like the old adage, you know, there'll be those that think it's too big, those that think it's too small, and that means it's probably just about right, you know, if we, uh, if we get that. So I'm going to turn this over to Anna. Uh, you may remember that Anna, before her current uh, role, was vice president of Jefferson Institute for Quality. She's a master's prepared nurse and a national expert on healthcare quality. Um, uh, Eric, uh, former US attorney, uh, and um, uh, has worked with us for uh, over a year now. Both very, very adept at working on complex issues, and particularly working with Anna for many years. Uh, we won't tell you how many. Don't share that, Anna. Um, uh, there's no one better at developing or facilitating a complex process. And you know, I, th I took a whack at it at our initial uh, call together steering committee meeting, and these guys came back to me uh, like a week later and went, eh, not so much, maybe we should do it this way. And I'm, uh, I may be bullheaded, but frequently I'm smart enough to listen to the advice I'm getting. So um, these guys really set this process up. Thank you again for the opportunity to give you an update on where we stand. So as uh, Dr. Brumstead shared with you, we have a structure we've put in place that we hope will facilitate this planning process uh, for um, our patients and families and also for the state. So as Dr. Brumstead described, we do have a steering committee, um, the complement of which he's shared with you. We also, underneath that steering committee, have a more nimble planning committee uh, that's populated by Dr. Brumstead, myself, Eric Miller. We have a resource from the Jefferson Institute for Quality who has expertise in project management that can keep us moving forward quickly given the timeline that we're working within. Uh, we're also obviously pulling in Dr. Bob Parentini, who's an expert in um, his field, and it will help us inform uh, the process as we move forward. 
Additionally, uh, we have Jason Williams, um, who with his governmental and um, community relations expertise will make sure that we're pulling in um, resources and opinions that will help inform the process as well. And then as Dr. Brumstead shared, we have HALSA advisory um, at that table as well to um, make sure that the process that we're using will inform ultimately the design of um, a, a facility that will enable us providing exceptional care to this underserved population. So um, the planning committee um, has uh, launched. Um, we have met and decided that the best way to really keep this moving forward and in a swift fashion is to um, define uh, the project into three phases. Phase one will really focus through the data analytics that Dr. Brumstead has shared with you, the size and the scope of the uh, facility that we're planning. So the major focus of phase one is really data analysis. Um, looking at constituents' engagement, looking at the financials at a high level, the legal ramifications, and also the governmental relations that um, uh, entail, and, and really understanding the scope of a new facility. Phase two will be yeah, focused. When you're walking through the phases, could you just give us the timeline for those phases as well? Sure. We're hoping for phase one to have that completed by fall of 2018. Uh, phase two, which will be focused on design and operational requirements, really is focused on primarily what the, the facility could look and feel like. Again, important to include constituent engagement, clinical perspectives in that um, how we operate the facility also impacts on the design. And then um, looking at the finances of that as well as um, the constituency piece. And we're looking for phase two. Um, for the design and operational requirements, including what would be the location of the facility yet to be determined. Uh, we're hoping at, the, at that point that uh, we'll obviously follow the uh, fall 2018 timeline, but the time frame for that at this point has not been specified. It will really be impacted um, by phase one significantly. Um, and we're hoping that obviously phase one and phase two kind of flow one to the other, um, so that will also impact the, the hard time frame for that. Phase three will begin with implementation of a detailed construction, financing, and operational plans. Um, again, that phase is, the time frame is yet to be determined. Um, also, I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about um, the notion of positioning this facility in the central Vermont arena. And we think that's advantageous for a number of reasons. Um, it, as, as denoted in its name, we are centrally located, so it's convenient, we think, for patients and families to reach this facility once it's been determined to be adjacent somewhere in the CBMC campus. Uh, we also know that um, you know, for, for us to really service the state as a whole, a central location, like Central Vermont, Central Vermont Medical Center specifically, will really also um, advantage the population that we're trying to meet. Uh, the other piece that's critical is once you build it um, and you have patients occupying facility like that, you have to staff it and operationalize it. At this point, Central Vermont is very well positioned from a both provider and a, a nurse and ancillary staffing perspective. Within the last year, Central Vermont, um, at a nursing level, um, we had a turnover rate prior to um, in May of 17 of 17%. Uh, we are down to 4% turnover in our RNs at this point in time with no um, travelers in our facility. And we think that that track record will enable us to continue to bring nurses into our facility to treat this population. When I've um, met with community members, which is just beginning, um, so I will say that, we've had a, a, a community forum, um, just in general with my new tenure in the organization, and I've asked the question about how would this be received in Central Vermont. I'm not hearing anything um, negative at this point. In fact, what I am hearing is an appreciation and awareness that this population is underserved and needs to be treated. And what I'm hearing even internally within um, my own staff is um, really gratitude that the network is stepping up and um, dealing with a, a population that they acknowledge is underserved at this point in time. 
So at this point, and I will say it's at this point, we're not hearing any uh, negatives around the notion of positioning uh, this facility in the central Vermont arena. In fact, we're hearing positives. So Anna, is uh, part of the process you described maybe a little bit more specifics on uh, when and how we would engage various constituency groups to, to gain their input? So um, we've uh, talked about, and again, this is um, early on, is to offer um, a variety of community forums that would enable people to um, give input into uh, the variety of phases of the planning process. We think that building that kind of um, consensus as we move forward will really enable us to design a, a product that will meet the needs of not only this patient population, but also our community and constituents. So we're um, anticipating that we'll keep that going and we're also open to feedback on the best way to do that. So just a couple other um, uh, comments on that. Um, rather than having uh, everybody that we would need at every level of uh, this planning process uh, on the steering committee or the planning committee, um, as we went through, we get to a, uh, a financing uh, piece. We pull our finance team together and other finance folks, uh, likely from the state, uh, to uh, engage. We get to um, the patient uh, and advocacy community. We have groups that Dr. Peratini has worked with for years that we will bring to the table and, as Anna said, have other uh, community forums. We really uh, believe that um, uh, we need to have that input as we move along and that we can't, particularly for this project in this state, um, uh, sacrifice everything for speed. I believe we still can stick with that uh, three to four year time frame that I committed to uh, earlier, but particularly at this uh, phase one uh, and phase two as we're really figuring out um, the size and what it looks like and how it's programmed that we really want to get uh, that input and we think we can uh, we can uh, do that it's going to be uh, difficult even with phase one to hit that uh, November uh, plus minus a month time frame. But we think uh, that with the uh, activity that we've uh, already got going and the focus of folks on it, that we can, uh, we can do that. Very encouraging. Questions from the board? Uh, yeah, I had a question on, you know, how you'll be putting, I guess, in your capital plan, the placeholder for this, because you have a lot of things going on with the EPIC implementation and the Miller building. And, you know, we obviously committed 21 million from the overage in the prior year towards this plan. And just making sure you have that in your forward-looking plans, even though you won't have all of the details, you know, solidified yet. Um, because yes. you're looking at covenants and things like that. And, and you know, we have included that in our budget uh, presentation um, uh, and the information that we've provided as uh, an up and coming uh, CON event uh, and capital project. Um, we're just getting through uh, our budget submission, and uh, we have some other activities that are occupying our finance folks right now, um, uh, but uh, this summer uh, we've committed to our board that we will redo our uh, five-year financial framework, capital framework, um, uh, and you all have seen that before. It's a, it uh, lends itself to an iterative process, and as we do that uh, in the upcoming uh, six weeks, we'll be putting placeholders in the appropriate years of that five-year plan uh, for such a facility. Obviously, at this early stage, uh, it probably won't be until the next year that we really will be able to refine that uh, uh, capital plan and financial framework based on, uh, on this project. But it's one of the drivers for uh, redoing the, uh, the framework at this time. 
it'll be there and we'll share it with you as soon as we get that done. Okay. Other questions? No. So, as you recall, this all unfolded very rapidly. On uh, March 13th, the staff recommendation from the board was that these funds be used to reduce charges and filter through uh, to rate reductions uh, for um, uh, you know, customers of the healthcare system. And uh, two weeks later, we, the vote was taken, and it was decided that this project uh, quite uh, uh, rightly deserves precedence. Um, but when, but it, because it happened so fast, I think there were some things that just didn't get touched upon. And one of them is uh, the interest on this reserve money um, and whether or not uh, you would agree that um, interest on this reserve somehow tied to the uh, uh, interest rates um, uh, achieved by your, your other reserves uh, would stay uh, with this reserve and, and, and be there uh, to support this project. Um, and if I don't get to uh, answer your question, uh, come, come back to me. But um, it, with the project in the financial framework and with the commitments that I've made and with the full knowledge of our board of trustees that we've made those commitments, uh, the dollars are there. If we set up a specific restricted reserve fund, no, we have not uh, done that uh, at this point. But we do have the uh, cash reserves on the balance sheet of the network uh, to uh, include this. And like I say, once we put that in our financial framework um, and, uh, you know, uh, I am still allowed to make most commitments along with our board for the uh, for our organizations. Um, you know that's uh, that's what we got, and, and we do have the the cash uh, balance to be able to definitely uh, provide that twenty one uh, million dollars. I will tell you right now, even this early in phase one. That's not the number you're going to see in our capital framework. It's going to be more than that uh, to get this done, even if we figure out a way to do other bonding and have others share in the, in the cost of this. I understand that. I, um, I just, uh, you know, the quick calculation, even at a, like a, you know, a 10 year treasury bill of 3%. Um, you know, on $21 million is, you know, 660000 bucks a year. And and I my guess is, as I think you would agree, that this is going to cost more than $21 million. And so I'm just hoping uh, that, uh, you know, a piece of that growth can be the interest that um, um, is earned on the $21 million that are now in the bottom line of your balance sheet. Yes, I mean, I, uh, again, I think that's going to be more than eclipsed by what the ultimate cost and the contribution of the UVM Health Network is going to be. Um, so thank you for the update. Uh, I want to first say this is very encouraging. Since I've been on the board, this, these are the first big steps that I've really seen us take as a state in trying to break up the logjam and avert, you know, what we you know is a ongoing crisis in our mental health delivery system. So I want to thank you for the time and effort and work that you put into this. Um, a couple questions. One is, you, uh, Anna, you talked a little about how it was received in your community. I'm actually wondering how this project uh, is being received by providers in the state, by other hospitals, by designated agents, by other people who are actually on the ground, you know, dealing with uh, the mental health delivery system and other hospitals that are facing the ED business overloads, things like that. So. Yeah, Anna can speak to her uh, uh, her experience on this. I was uh, at a uh, Vermont uh, Association Hospital Health Systems um, uh, annual retreat uh, a month ago, um, and um, uh, this topic came up. And for those hospital CEOs, there was uh, a lot of support for moving forward and uh, obviously for being engaged because we all share this issue of um, difficulty in the emergency room. From 
uh, the interaction I've had specifically with a r emergency room physicians in Burlington, um, uh, there are two things making them very happy uh, right now. One is unrelated. Uh, we're fully accredited to start an emergency medicine residency and we'll bring our first residents uh, in next year. And the second is they see light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I think healthcare workers and providers are very resilient and what was driving people really to distraction uh, that we're trying to provide services is that there didn't seem to be anything that was happening. There was a lot of talk, a lot of hand wringing, but um, you know, being able to actually take some action that's going to um, uh, alleviate this problem, I think, has people right now settled down. Uh, you know, if you're in the emergency room uh, and it's July and everybody is out trying to do crazy things to themselves and um, uh, half of your beds are occupied and your waiting room is filled up, you're going to have momentary um, uh, anxiety, but I think overall, sort of the temperature has come down a bit because we're actually doing something. So, I'll just echo that. So, from our providers um, within Central Vermont and our providers within the network, overall, there's a very positive sense about this um, initiative moving forward. Um, so they feel like they've been heard, particularly for emergency room providers. This has been a challenge for them for years. Um, so there's um, nothing more discouraging than holding a um, mental health patient, a um, psychiatric patient in an ED, and um, feeling like we're not doing what we could do for that individual and meeting the standard of care. Um, so I can tell you that um, there's relief on the part of our providers that we're addressing this. As I said earlier, um, I have nothing but positive so far from not only our, phys our providers in general, but our, our nursing staff, that this is being addressed. And when I've, I've just finished a series of employee forums and gone out to all of our clinics, and again, this is a point of discussion out there, and they're, they're grateful that um, the network has taken this on um, and hoping to partner with the state in um, meeting this need for our psychiatric patients. So overall, I would say um, very, very positive. It's very challenging to see patients cared for in ED um, when the services are just not there for them despite all of our best efforts. I guess my second area of questioning, um, the data analysis, obviously phase one is so crucial to the success of this project. You sort of have one shot to get this, not really, but you know, one shot to get the size and the scope right. Um, and so the data analysis piece is really intriguing to me. Um, using Porter as a surrogate for critical access and CVMC as a surrogate for PBS hospitals sounds great. I also, when you mentioned a little bit, Dr. Bromstead, um, FOSS and the Department of Mental Health having some other data analytics, because I'd love to, you know, those are two hospitals that serve two particular areas, but obviously this is a statewide problem and, and having the data and the analysis really be at, at a statewide level seems really paramount to the success of identifying what the size and scope should be. So a little curious if you can just talk a little about the role of the Department of Mental Health and FOSS in really helping you figure out what is the extent of the problem throughout the state. They have um, unique data sets. Um, uh, VAS is, uh, their data set is provided by each of the hospitals that have a variety of different systems and even ability to track who's in their emergency room at any given, uh, uh, any given day. Um, but total willingness to share their information. That, hasn't always been the case in other situations. So everybody very uh, willing to uh, put uh, their information in. The uh, 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 Department of Mental Health, my understanding is, has very good data on um, those that um, uh, are uh, involuntary level one, what they call level one patients. Um, which are the most acute patients, but that's not the whole um, uh, data set either. So we really have to put this uh, together. And you know, one piece again that we're 
actively analyzing is a, essentially a uh, software program that uh, the Department of Mental Health and Vaz is very interested in. But that's still, you got to have the right data inputs into any model. As you know, as an economist, the inputs into the model are as important as the model itself. Um, so we're rapidly moving through that and having meetings even in the beautiful uh, two months of summer we have here in Vermont. Uh, we're, we're working really hard to do that because what we can't do is get into analysis paralysis and we can't get into a situation where various constituencies are cranking their own number and we end up trying at the end of the process to figure out what number is right. And I guess the last comment I would make is that we have, whatever we build, we have to build uh, flexibility in to either uh, efficiently uh, staff, even if we shell some of the space, or to expand, and it may be that you know we end up not getting it precisely right, but we have the flexibility to go up or down efficiently um, uh, to make sure that uh, that ultimately we're serving the population, which is what we're trying to do. And I guess that was my last question. You led right into it with the CVMC as an identified site. Are there any physical limitations? Say you decide X is the right number of beds, but then at that site there is either physical constraints in terms of property or in terms of, you know, we know that there's limitations on federal reimbursements. Are, is there any upper bound on what CVMC could effectively manage? I'll, I'll let Anna answer too, but I, I think we haven't run into any yet, but what we have to be very, very careful of, and I'll channel Anna on this one, they have a 50-year-old facility there, and what we don't want to do is something that encumbers the right uh, out into the future master facility plan for that organization. But I think we do have uh, options, and that's something that HALSA is just expert at doing, is trying to fit this together. So I just, again, want to reinforce that we were, uh, before this um, idea came up, we were in the process, along with other network hospitals, of doing master facilities plan. Um, John is absolutely correct. Our facility this year is 50 years old, and Woodridge is 25 years old. And there's been, um, not uncommonly in healthcare, deferred maintenance on our building and physical plant. And so for people that have been in our acute care facility, it's, it's worn. And um, our intensive care unit um, is also uh, pretty tight. Um, so, uh, and not meeting the current standard of care. So we are in a process of looking at our um, uh, 10 to 15 year master's facilities plan. And in that, uh, really assessing um, the geography around our organization, what's available to us. Uh, we're fortunate in that we do have available space, um, but we are also um, designing this facility with the future needs of our community in mind. Uh, so we want these to move um, in concert and be supportive of one another um, going forward, and that's our intent. So using HALSA for this planning process is um, uh, very appropriate in that we are also using HALSA for our overall master's facilities plan. Thank you. Okay, other questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up to the public for questions or comments. Ken. Thank you. Um, I, in some ways, I don't know where to begin. It's a little staggering. Uh, because I think back to 1984, and I had the opportunity then to publicly say, uh, that the Vermont State Hospital was a disgrace. And um, among other things, I was quickly ushered up into the Governor Madam Cuban's office where I was spanked, I mean verbally spanked, um, for saying that in the way I said. Part of the commentary uh, in the ensuing years was we really need uh, our hospital network to step up and play a major role in addressing mental health issues. And that was 1984, 1985, and I think that in some ways it's uh, you know, a rare opportunity to stand here today and say, 
it's taken a few years, maybe a few decades, but there is a potential plan on the, on the table here to realize the notion that our leading largest medical center hospital may, you know, play a commanding role in the delivery of quality mental health services. So I would call this, uh, you know, without uh, being overly positive, because there are some negative things to raise, um, but a historic opportunity in the fight for parity in the state of Vermont, that we may actually reduce reliance on what the old model was, which is kind of a state-run, uh, uh, state hospital approach, and uh, equalize that, the quality treatment in a hospital setting. Um, and I would say that anybody who's dealing with cancer or lung disease or heart disease um, would be shocked to be going to a state-run specialized facility, which has been the model that we've had in Vermont up until now. So I, I really think that um, I have no idea how we got here. I uh, have some suspicions, but I, I can't quite kind of figure it out. I think part of the responsibility goes to the brilliance of the Green Mountain Care Board um, to at least put some proposal on the table uh, that, that wasn't uh, necessarily um, um, planned for six months or a year. It, it, as uh, Tom Pelham said, it, it was fairly recent that this notion has all come about. So having said that, I do want to raise a few issues and maybe ask a few questions. As a matter of fact, I think um, very few people in the room, other than John Rumstead and I, who um, met over a you know, very difficult circumstance at Fletcher Allen, because that was the last big initiative, really, out of the hospital. And frankly, it was a poorly conceived plan uh, to move, actually, psychiatric services off the main campus and out of Fanny Allen. And that plan um, would have, in the opinion of many, um, really been a step backwards. Uh, in fact, Bishka, um, after extensive hearings, who uh, rejected that plan, I think it was the first time it ever happened in their history, it was sort of pro forma that, that you go through. I think John Bumstead was at the table during those discussions. And one of the things that we, we all learned a lot, one of the things that I think we learned was that it is critical to have those people who are going to be providing services make sure they're very much front and center and with the program. So I, I kind of, one question I have is, is there a way of enhancing and enlarging the input, particularly of the psychiatric community, um, beyond the chair, Bob Parentini, who's a, who's a perfectly uh, capable, excellent professional. But the reason I say that is when uh, one of the determining moments in, in the debate, and it was 2001, uh, was when four psychiatrists from the department came in and said they do not support the plan that Fannie Allen uh, was presenting that it was poorly conceived clinically, it was bad for patients, on and on. It was a dramatic moment. There's no great secret, they risked their jobs in doing this, and it was um, difficult. So I, I just think as this idea at least moves forward, I urge uh, UVM Medical Center and parts of the center to promote and engage publicly, the psychiatry community and other health care providers, front and center, not as an add-on six months later or a year later, because these are the folks who are going to be in the rooms with the patients that we're talking about. And it was a mistake back in 2001. I do have to say, and I think uh, Dr. Rumstead would agree, that after the plan was rejected um, and uh, the admission required uh, the, the hospital to build on the main campus. We had a very collaborative approach that brought in advocates, certainly the professional community, leaders of the hospital, architects, to a point where we even had uh, interior decorators coming in, which I could hardly believe, but we had a discussion about how to make the rooms patient-friendly. 
so I think that's a good model, and I, I guess the end line is, or the question is, is around making sure that the board also hears not simply from, uh, and I want to want to call Bob a figurehead because he's much more than that, but we have to make sure that the community is crafting a program that will work. And sometimes when you look at the panels that are being enlisted, great expertise, but few of them have the, uh, the responsibility of dealing with the patients. Um, I would call, you know, this circumstance, this project, my name for it, is let's make a deal. It's sort of like a game show. Um, circumstances came up where clearly there was excess revenue, um, a great desire on the part of many people, including I think the board and, and to some degree the university medical center to say, let's try to figure out this terrible crisis in mental health. And um, I do have to say um, that somehow uh, in taking on the responsibility, I hope particularly the board will hold uh, the leadership at the university and at Central Vermont, hold their feet to the fire. Um, this could be one of those projects that just goes on and on in planning and uh, you know, I heard four years, I'd like to think, I, I don't hear that well, so I was hoping it was three years that there'll be the openings of the, of the facility. So, um, you know, it is in some ways a, a major step uh, towards possibly realizing parity. And I think the very last question is, uh, I think everyone, and I think uh, Dr. Rumstead has, has mentioned it, we actually have a, you know, a, a relatively new psychiatric hospital. I know I was there for the ribbon cutting up in Berlin, and it's actually one of the most expensive psychiatric hospitals in the country. Uh, and I think a lot of attention uh, needs to be placed as this project unfolds in figuring out much more definitively what the role might be, who's going to run it, is it going to be a state entity? Is the university going to play a role? And what can we learn from the past? But it's a very expensive operation, and clearly there's a talk about changing its mission. So thanks for the opportunity of, giving, of offering some comments and some maybe historical perspective. Thank you, Ken. I think the only three words I heard were brilliance of the board. <laughs> <laughs> John, I heard that. address the question? I, I heard that, too, I'm sure. And, uh, Mr. Liebertoff and I do go back quite a ways, and I've learned a lot from Mr. Liebertoff. Uh, we've had really good conversations. We've had a couple of tense ones. Um, but I couldn't agree more with um, everything you said except the need to hold our feet to the fire. Um, since it was a bad attempt to do something really well and something really impactful and good. Uh, when we looked at putting uh, an inpatient psychiatric freestanding uh, uh, hospital on the Fannie Allen campus. Um, and the motivations for doing that, at least for me and for um, uh, current, our current clinicians, is to bring parity. And I even have used the same analogy that you used, Ken, in that, you know, having our uh, heart patients singled out from the rest and have their care being delivered through, even if delivered well, through a separate state-run system makes no more sense than what we're doing with mental health. And that really has spurred us several times to come back around and try and, you know, capture that dream of bringing um, mental health services much more integrated into and therefore definitionally in parity with the rest of our 
uh, with the rest of our services. So that really is the motivation here. Um, and I uh, give it to you all the credit for uh, allowing us to match a couple of issues together to try and come up uh, and to come up with this uh, this great solution. Couldn't agree more on the uh, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. That is uh, an asset that we have in our system, and to not put that capacity into the mix and challenge ourselves to make sure that that capacity is being used for the best purpose to serve this population. That's definitely part of our planning process, but it's also a place that we're going to need a lot of input to make sure that that, uh, that works. Um, uh, I don't think Bob would take offense at being called uh, a figurehead, um, uh, at least not uh, in public. But Bob's not here today because he's seeing patients in Middlebury. So uh, he's also uh, a great, uh, great clinician who, in certain stressful times, I might even rely on for some uh, some advice. Um, the advocacy. Uh, community that came together with us and our clinicians to design the inpatient units at um, the medical center in Burlington is what I was referring to. That's a group that Bob Peratini has had meeting regularly since that time for other facility improvements and other programmatic improvements. So that's a group that um, uh, we intend to engage fully in this process with others because you know we want this to be uh, um, uh, from folks from around the state. And the same thing with provider input. We have a group that actually Bob Peratini and uh, um, Eric have been working with for a year to develop for the University of Vermont Health Network um, a uh, strategic plan for mental health services. Now that's sort of a uh, inside of the, uh, the network kind of thing, and I don't want it to seem like we're being exclusive, but it's something that as a large organization and provider, we want to make sure that we have our act together and we have have the best thinking led by our clinicians on what our strategies should be. So with this opportunity, we're engaging that group again as uh, uh, part uh, of the planning. So we will take every, uh, make every effort to have uh, the providers and those who know most about how to use uh, a facility in a patient and family-friendly way at the table uh, as we design this. And if you think that we're not, we will listen when you say, you know, why don't you uh, uh, try this? Or, you know, I think that's part of these quarterly reports is that uh, um, I don't think we need our feet held to the fire. We're very excited about doing this, but, um, you know, if we have blinders on over something, you know, you got to let us know. We will not be shy. And, uh, you know, just, I know that about you. And I, never, I don't think you ever thought that you were underregulated either. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will say, though, that uh, Ken is absolutely right in that uh, over the years from what I've witnessed, uh, there's not, nothing that delays a project more than an advocacy group that believes they were ignored or didn't have a seat at the table. So it's very sound advice that uh, Ken has put forward, and I'm sure you will take that into consideration. Is there other? Yes, Jeff. Yeah, just um, Jeff Teeman with the Hospital Association. Uh, just speaking to Jessica Holmes' question about the level of support um, in the provider community for this project, I just want to reiterate what Dr. Brumstead mentioned. Um, in addition to the CEOs who did speak together about this at our retreat a few weeks back, we also convened forums with chief medical officers, emergency department medical directors, other clinicians, um, and even policy folks, all of whom have expressed solidarity with this plan and who have said they appreciate the effort and I, I think also the elegant policy solution that was put forward for a state that uh, very much wants to collaborate on the right set of solutions. 
um, none of which will be easy or fast, as we've talked about. Um, but I appreciate Ken's perspective and, and all the voices that we will hear throughout the process. Um, as an association, we'll certainly listen carefully to all those perspectives and welcome comments and feedback as we move forward. So um, I'll just offer that and also thank um, Anna and Dr. Brumstead for, for their leadership and, um, and the other hospitals as well for everything they're doing to, uh, to contribute to this problem, to solving it. Thank you, Jeff. Walter? Just a small question here. I was just wondering why there were no um, frontline workers or patients on the steering committee. Um, we've actually um, thought about that. And um, uh, the medical center particularly, and now spreading to other network hospitals, um, we are putting uh, patient and family advocates on virtually all of uh, our committees. Um, and um, the thought process to this point has been that um, uh, we just want to get our act together a little bit, but that almost certainly we will um, get uh, to that point and probably not uh, in the far too distant future. And Anna's been a real advocate and purveyor of the systems required to be really patient and family friendly. So I'll, I'll let you take a shot at that too as co-chair. So. Um CVMC is standing up a patient and family advisory committee. UVMMC already has one, and Porter is on their way as well. And that's a very rich um, patient family centered approach to getting input. So we're going to leverage those systems that already exist versus having, um, at least at the start, an N of one on the steering committee. So we're going to really utilize uh, a group that's already meeting, that's giving us input into a lot of our systems and processes that we're designing. So we've shifted to a patient and family centered model and patient family centered philosophy and that philosophy shifts from doing two and four patients and families to partnering with patients and families and that that voice is a very rich voice as I've already been described so important in not only design but operations of just about everything we do in the healthcare system so we're fully intending on leveraging that participation going forward but thank you for the reminder any other questions or comments from the public? Not, uh, we appreciate very much uh, the uh, report and update, and we look forward to working with your staff uh, to come forward with a, um, what we could agree is a, a standardized report moving forward for each of the quarters that does not create extra administrative burden for no reason. So we're with you. We want efficiency on these reports. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get there. And I think we've done some really good progress on this first one. So thank you. No, thank you for that. And thanks for your time. OK. Tom, is Todd here as well? Yeah, I'm here. I'm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to first thank the board for accommodating us today. We have a uh, time-sensitive request that we're going to put in, in some context here um, for you, and uh, then certainly glad to answer any questions that you have, and uh, if, uh, if you're so inclined to you know, uh, uh, consider the question that we have for you today. Uh, the general topic is risk management, so we're going to do a little bit of a reminder in terms of our risk management model. We have an element uh, that I think was contemplated that we didn't uh, know until now could be a possibility for this year's uh, ability to manage one cares risk programs which as you know for the first time across Medicare Medicaid and our Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, qualified health plan program involve what's called two-sided risk meaning there's a population target set for our attributed lives in those programs that if one care exceeds that spending target that we owe money back to uh, one uh, two or all three of those payers uh, depending on our performance 
Okay, so we do have a PowerPoint presentation that we did send electronically today and, and have some hard copies in the room. Uh, the first thing to remind you of is, is that OneCare's core risk coverage model is based on the hospitals uh, accepting uh, community-based total cost of care risk and risk against a, a fixed payment model for their services that they provide to their local community. Uh, and really it's designed in the backbone to uh, mean that in any scenario that the hospitals combined would cover the maximum risk pay of payback uh, to all of our risk uh, payer programs. Um, the risk payback is calculated at the ACO wide level and will be a transfer or check from one care to those payers. But behind the scenes, the hospitals have agreed to assume that risk for us in a model that, uh, uh, again, uh, no matter if anything else happened that would be fully covered, and all the hospitals knew what their estimates were of maximum risk, as did the board uh, in, uh, in these models uh, uh, and budgets, um, such that in that unlikely scenario that all three programs maxed out their risk model, uh, that it would have a chilling effect, I think, in continued participation uh, in, in, in these programs and in, in the all-payer model, uh, but wouldn't jeopardize the solvent see of any of the hospitals uh, uh, given the level of commitment. Uh, that they made. So we basically distribute the maximum risk that one care would have to uh, each of the hospitals based on the HSA, healthcare service area, locally attributed population. Um, uh, and that's really the core of our risk management model, that no matter what else happens, we know that we're covered uh, on the strength of, of uh, uh, hospital balance sheets uh, 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 in Vermont, but with the hope that we wouldn't need it and in fact would earn shared savings that we could distribute to those hospitals. Uh, 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 as the incentive to take the risk. Okay, for 2018, we're, our current models have the maximum potential combined risk uh, as approximately 21 million. Uh, in our budget model, uh, final budget model last year, I think it was as high as 23 million, but based on final attribution and participation, uh, it ended up uh, being, at least in our estimate now, uh, 21 million. And just to remind you, we owe these back after the performance year, so these would be monies that would be paid, you know, starting as early as this time next year for the 2018 performance year because you got to have plenty of time to work through all of the claims, make sure all the expenses are accrued uh, against our risk target and that, that it applies to uh, the, the participants uh, and, and attributed populations uh, that were part of the model. So yeah, this time next year we could be contemplating uh, how do we cover uh, a payback uh, or uh, distribute savings. Okay, so in addition to that, uh, OneCare does have some mechanisms that can either reduce the probability of a higher payback or that maximum payback and or provide some potential cash relief against that payment uh, from the hospitals through one year uh, to the payers. And in place right now as we sit is Medicare requires under its next generation program a securitized instrument. And we had a number of choices of this. We could you know, uh, uh, buy a letter of credit uh, from a bank. We could uh, create an irrevocable uh, 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 trust. Or we could secure a jointly owned bank account between one care and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services with uh, a defined amount that Medicare sets up uh, and calculates for us. We chose that third option, uh, but had to fund it up front. Um, and so it requires both OneCare and, and uh, CMS to, to dip into it, but provides rights for CMS to that money if we default on cash payment um, uh, in, in another uh, method. So uh, that number ended up being $4.1 million that was required of us. It's absolutely not negotiable. It had to be of a very specific type with specific documentation uh, that we had to set up. Uh, Medicare doesn't require us to use that $4.1 million toward a, pay a payback if owed, um, but we can use it for that. So we have, you know, in effect set aside at least some money that could be used if, if, if that's what the ACO uh, One Care chose to use if we had a, a, a repayment to Medicare. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont uh, does have included in our contract with them a what's called a truncation program. These are, are very typical in a lot of these risk-based contracts. And what it basically means is it's, it's a stop loss at an individual patient for the year level, meaning any patient who uses so many services that eclipses a certain threshold uh, that the risk-bearing network is held harmless for that. Uh, we got plenty of skin in the game because these uh, uh, thresholds uh, are measured in the hundreds of thousands thousands of dollars, uh, and it's really just a recognition of two things. One, which we as a provider network 
shouldn't have good work over a large population be ruined by a few really, really tough patients that probably we couldn't have done a whole lot to prevent their disease uh, and did need to treat uh, other significant illness. But it also recognizes the fact that uh, payers like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont have their own truncation reinsurance and programs to help offset their risk at larger populations and not unfairly uh, damage their reserve position. So really for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, it was uh, based on uh, their offer for us to participate in their truncation coverage and included in our calculation uh, model. Uh, and it was something that, that our board uh, supported as a piece of, of our contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, there's also the Green Mountain Care Board required general reserves. And as you recall, our budget order included uh, uh, establishing a $2.2 million risk reserve. Uh, we have made the first required uh, uh, allocation of that in the, in the amount of $1.1 million. Uh, the, it does require us to get board approval to use that for paying back risk uh, uh, payments if owed uh, or any other purpose. Uh, but it is there and could be used to offset you know, higher levels of payback if it comes to that, and we all agree that in lieu of hospitals writing checks for new money, uh, that we would use uh, some of that reserve. So those are three things that are in place right now. Um, still, still in the cards for 2018 coverage, and I know this sounds a, a little uh, uh, strange that we're halfway through the year, but the early results aren't voluminous enough or indicative enough to really say that either side uh, in these models could could be uh, 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 able to, to uh, understand uh, how the year is going to end up. One is Medicare offers its own truncation program to risk-bearing ACOs, whether they're next generation or two-sided risk uh, shared savings program ACOs. We expected that to be offered uh, that to us in April. There was some question around a modified next generation ACO, how they would handle that, and did it have any any, you know, misalignment with the all-payer model. We haven't heard from Medicare on that. We're not sure that it, it would be a program that we'd be interested in or not, because you actually have to, there's some financial implications, both in the base expenditures as well as how they calculate in the actual expenditures. So, you know, I guess it's possible we come, could come back and, and ask you uh, for uh, uh, the ability to, to participate in that program um, uh, uh, with an eye toward it being Medicare and your substantial role in the details of how our baseline and targets are set. I don't expect that, but just, just to throw that out there. Now, the other thing that we have talked about, including during the budget, was third-party risk coverage that we roughly called reinsurance uh, as uh, an ability by uh, one care to pay an expense through a contract that would return some offset to certain risk scenarios. Uh, we, uh, uh, during the budget cycle, you know, didn't think that was likely. We were having trouble finding carriers for it. Uh, uh, we really uh, ha had been uh, trying to find if there's anybody who provides sort of some general risk coverage, whether it be on any of the three big risk programs. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to fill you in on, on some late breaking uh, developments in, in this arena that we think makes some sense if, if, if you agree. So the focus for today and the rest of the presentation is uh, our uh, request uh, uh, to get approval uh, to enter into uh, a risk protection program that is reinsurance like but technically not reinsurance. So I'm going to ask Tom uh, to take over the presentation uh, from here who's been very involved in the details. Hi, everyone. So just to, re to remind uh, the board and everyone else in the room that we had $1.5 million in our uh, Green Mountain Care Board approved budget for reinsurance. Uh, this was a, a placeholder that we were starting to explore the reinsurance market, uh, thought we might go that route, but really was intended to be this expense for some third-party risk protection. As I'll explain uh, further in the presentation, it's not exactly reinsurance, but it, the spirit of it is, is virtually the same. We have worked with our risk protection broker uh, over literally months to find a partner who is interested in entering into some ACO protection models and then also seek a, a proposal from a partner uh, that really meets the needs of the network, our board, uh, and, and the Green Mountain Care Board here. 
This has come together very quickly. We uh, have spoken with a number of different uh, partners and, and found one that was interested in exploring this book of business for themselves and have developed a model that we find very attractive. And uh, in, in a lot of ways, this really kind of gelled quickly. So I, I appreciate your uh, flexibility in hearing this kind of time sensitive manner and thank the, the staff as well for accommodating us there. So as part of our budget order, we were required to notify the board of our intent and then also seek approval to buy a reinsurance policy. Uh, this isn't technically reinsurance, but we want to comply with the spirit of this, which is to seek approval for this type of protect protection and using that $1.5 million of budget expense line uh, for this, even though it's technically not reinsurance. So here's how this works, uh, trying to keep this uh, high level, but OneCare will make defined payments to this third party partner based on our Medicare program benchmarks for the end stage renal disease population and non end stage renal disease populations. Those are the two cohorts in our Medicare program. The point of this bullet uh, is that the payments that OneCare makes is linked to our actual program total cost of care, which is a nice protection for us. So as attrition happens, the cost of this uh, moves with it. The way that the payment would come back to OneCare uh, is that if the total cost of care spend against our Medicare target reaches 102.5% of the benchmark, said differently, exceeds by 2.5% of that target, OneCare will receive 72% of any spend from that point forward up to the risk corridor of 5% of in the Medicare program. The 72% is derived from two numbers. It's the 80% sharing that we selected as part of our Medicare program. So for every dollar of shared savings we earn or, or owe back, we get 80 cents or pay 80 cents. And, and this is pretty standard protocol in this type of risk protection model, there's a 90-10, 90%, 10 10% share. Once you kind of get into the, the point where there's a payment coming back, that's to keep skin in the game for the ACO so that we just don't blow through our target and clean up on, on any kind of proceeds coming back. This arrangement is being structured as a swap rather than a traditional insurance reinsurance policy. Basically, a swap is an exchange of cash flows. We're agreeing to make a payment uh, based on certain criteria to this third party, and they're agreeing to make payments back to us under these certain conditions around the, the how deep we get into our risk corridor. Uh, that's a little bit different than a traditional reinsurance model. Uh, we like this because it's a little bit simpler, believe it or not, and this is a program that uh, our counterpart has developed with other ACOs and, and our broker has endorsed as a, as a reasonable uh, path forward. So the, the core benefits of this proposal, uh, the purpose of this arrangement is merely to limit the maximum downside risk for one care in network risk bearing hospitals. That, that's why we're entering into this arrangement. Uh, in the event of a, a bad year in our Medicare program, we'd like to have some protection that uh, alleviates the, the payment and the pain associated with the payback. In terms of scope, in the event of a substantial spending overrun and we were to hit our ACO level maximum risk for Medicare, the payback that would come to the ACO would be in the ballpark park of six and a half million. So when you think about the other protections that we have in place, the 4.1 that's already put into, into place with Medicare plus the six and a half, we're getting to a point where we have a lot of our Medicare maximum downside risk protection. This ultimately reduces the 21 million worst case scenario payment that that the hospitals would owe to one care that we would then pass on to the payers. In the event that we do receive proceeds from this protection, we will first accrue the benefits to any hospitals, HSAs, that exceeded their maximum risk limit for their, for their Medicare uh, program. This is to limit the need for any cross coverage or pooling. So in the model, if a hospital were to exceed their limit, we ask the other hospitals to collectively come together to, to fill that void and, and pick up the, the expense from that point forward. So we want to use this first to minimize the need to cross cover between hospitals. From there, if we've exhausted that completely, then we'd allocate the remaining available proceeds proportionally based on or to those that all have, have an overrun already, but remain within their maximum risk limit.
couple summary notes here. So we're, the cost of this program is well within the approved operating expense for reinsurance risk protection in our budget, so we're staying within our, our budget guidance on that front. This adds no additional risk to the network. This is really a risk mitigation uh, model that would reduce our payback um, reduce the cost for the hospitals in, in the event of a payback due to uh, Medicare in this case. The One Care Board and Finance Committees have both voted and endorsed this, uh, this model, so we have their support on that front. And then one of the really important points I'd like to make is that uh, we're interested in this approach to engage with a risk protection partner for the long term. This isn't intended to be a one-year model where we just buy this protection for one year and, and, and look for something else. We'll certainly do our diligence, but having a partner that starts to understand the nuances of the Vermont model here uh, and understands one care to some degree is um, something that we think will make getting into policies in future years easier and a little bit more seamless so that we're not in July trying to figure out a, a risk protection plan for the, for the current year. So this is really an attempt to find um, a collaborative partner, and I think we found them, uh, and engage in a long-term risk protection relationship. This is important, especially as we continue to grow the network, which will uh, also expand the maximum downside risk that uh, the ACO bears. Any, any questions or thoughts? Questions from the board? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. First, uh, you know, I think this is doing exactly what you want it to do with the reinsurance, so I um, applaud that you were able to get something where you, you couldn't do it right at budget time. So a couple questions would be, um, one, why aren't we doing it with the other payers? Um, so why aren't we doing it with the Medicaid and Blue Cross Blue Shield? And um, original, the original budget had the million five in for, for the um, reinsurance, and then through discussions and negotiations, we increased the reserve to 2.2 million. And I know if you want to get relief from that reserve, you also need approval from the board. So I, I would just question why you're not asking for, I guess we don't know the total numbers or we can't release that yet, but I would assume you're going to ask relief for the reserve for that as well. Yeah. So. Uh the, the first um, component about why just Medicare and not the other two, um, the reinsur reinsurance market or risk protection market is pretty immature, but there is some growing experience in the standard Medicare next generation ACO model. This particular partner has some experience in that realm. and. I think generally feels more comfortable working in that space. There's some um, reports that CMS sends us that are reliable and they have confidence in. And uh, in general, I think there's more comfort there than with some of our other programs. On top of that, the downside risk for Medicare is substantially greater than the other two programs. And out of the, out of the box here, uh, I, I think it's the right approach to get the Medicare model in place and then explore adding in the others once we start to develop that relationship further. So this is a way to ease into having a relationship with a risk protection partner um, because it got, to be honestly, really complicated to explain the Medicare and the nuances with the, the Vermont program plus the commercial program and the Medicaid program as well. So th this is easing into the, the pool a little bit. Um, and then the second question about the reserves. Uh, we would like to uh, explore our ability to reduce the required reserves per the Green Mountain Care Board budget order. I'd like to see what happens on this front and if we can get this approved first. That's a big part of doing that because uh, I, I view them as connected. And I also want to do a little bit of analysis on what I think is the right amount of reserves that we should have based on kind of our assessment of the risk exposure we have and what protections we have in place. So I, I view that as something that's forthcoming. I think we just thought today we wanted to offer this for approval of something that only had a unidirectional element to it. This only reduces the risk on what you've already approved. Uh, and, you know, our board approval of expending the dollars for this program we're talking about today and seeking approval for was contingent on us asking when we are ready for relief from those reserves, but it's not predicated on it. And so we just thought by having 
this reduce, but yet we you know want to reserve, re, uh, uh, reduce the reserves in one in one set would put a higher burden on the board of due diligence today rather than something that we're here telling you only reduces the risk on an already approved model under all those assumptions in the budget orders from December. And just one other thing, um, I think to make it easier to understand, you, you may want to um, do a chart that actually shows the numbers. And what I mean by that is Medicare, I know it's a little bit under, but it was around 400 million, I think, right, that you're looking at. So what we would be seeing is that the ACO has to take responsibility for the first 2.5% if it's over, right? So that's 10 million, so out of that 21 million risk. And then the second, Worst case scenario, if we hit the 5%, the next 10 million, we're saying Medicare pays two, the ACO would pay eight million, but in this case, the reinsurance would cover 7.2 million, right? And, and so you would pay 800,000, but I, I just think, you know, to make it easier to understand, just kind of laying out that chart, really, you know, updating the risk factor with all three payers, knowing that two of them won't get reinsurance, and the third one will. Yeah, in a perfect world, we would have brought some of those scenarios for you and, and, and some charts. But, uh, you know, we, we were, really the way this came about is long-term work with a broker and a couple of interested carriers where we just sort of said, look, if it doesn't meet these criteria on affordability attachment point, which is that 2.5%, at what point of overage do you start to get a benefit? And some other nuances to it's got to be based on our Vermont target, not sort of, uh, uh, you know, what a, a regular next-gen target would have been for us. You know, it took it took the market a, a while to say, you know what, those are actually reasonable asks. And, you know, it really wasn't until the last, you know, three to four weeks that this became a, a real option and possibility, and I needed to take it through my finance committee and board uh, before coming to, to seek this approval from you just to make sure that they, they would uh, approve expending those because, we, you know, it's really based on, on the operational costs and dues that, that we take from the, from the hospitals to fund. Any other questions? Are there any questions as well? Or I guess we go to the uh, public. Uh, is there a motion? I can make a motion. Uh, I move that we approve uh, the request to purchase the SWAT policy. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. So at this point, I will open it up uh, to the public for any comments or questions at this point. Seeing none, uh, before we vote, I just want to uh, thank Mike Barber and his team for really uh, being able to bring the board up in a very quick manner on the difference between a plain vanilla swap and reinsurance and uh, really doing the due diligence. So thank you, team. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks again for the time today. Really appreciate it. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new, new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone.